All right, let's get into the meat of what today's uh, topic will be about. And if you have not heard, science is kind of at the forefront of everything that's happening out there in the world right now with this pandemic over the past year and a half. But long before the pandemic, we have had a lot of people say, look, the science is just as tainted as anything else in our society. And of course, people never believe that. They all, and of course, those of us in the low carb and nutritional health space, we've known that a lot of the science is tainted. Look at what they've done to malign saturated fat. Look at what they've done to kind of hide the negative effects of sugar. Look at what they've done to make whole grains look like they're something that they're not. Look at what they've done to red meat to vilify it. We know how they can manipulate the science to make it look like it's something that it's not. So I have a study, not a study, but it's in a journal, and it's from this researcher. Her name is Catherine Flagel. She is from the Stanford uh, Prevention Research Center at the Department of Medicine, Stanford University School of Medicine. Very prestigious university. She's one of the lead researchers there. And so she wrote this article in the journal Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. This came out just a few days ago here in June of 2021. The title of the paper, The Obesity Wars and the Education of a Researcher, a Personal Account. Guys, this is going to blow you away because we always suspect things like this were happening, but now that you actually have hard evidence that they are hiding and censoring science, you know, it's one thing with what's happening on social media right now where they are shutting down people and silencing people because they're offering a dissenting opinion that's not liked. This is a researcher doing hard science and they're doing the same thing to her. So if you didn't believe it before, believe it after today. Oh, thank you, the Keto Celiac just bought a badge. Thank you for that. And again, if you're on Instagram and you like what I do here, definitely you can purchase a badge to show your love and appreciation for Jimmy Moore. And I will give you a shout out if I, uh, if I see that. And thank you Clubhouse for being here as well. All right, so let's get into this. They did have an abstract. A naive researcher, talking about Catherine Flagel, published a scientific article in a respectable journal. She thought her article was straightforward and defensible. It used only publicly available data and her findings were consistent with much of the literature on this topic. Her co-authors included two distinguished statisticians, but to her surprise, her publication was met with unusual attacks from some unexpected sources within the research community. These attacks were, by and large, not pursued through normal channels of scientific discussion. Her research became the target of an aggressive campaign that included insults errors, misinformation, social media posts, behind the scenes gossip and maneuvers, and complaints to her employer. Remember, she's at Stanford University. The goal appeared to be to undermine and discredit her work. The controversy was somewhat deliberately manufactured, and wait till you hear the details about how they manufactured this. And the attacks were primarily consisted of repeated assertions of these preconceived opinions. She learned firsthand the antagonism that could be provoked by inconvenient scientific findings. Guidelines and recommendations should be based on objective and unbiased data. Development of public policy regarding health and clinical recommendations is complex and needs to be evidence-based rather than belief-based. This can be challenging when, it, when it's a hot button topic involved. And remember, she's an obesity researcher. So she was taking a look, and we're going to get into specifically what she's taking a look at, but she was taking a look at obesity statistics and found something very interesting to share. And she thought, okay, this is interesting. Let's get it published. No big deal. And what she's run into is a lot of what we've seen over the past year with certain science is allowed, but certain other science is not allowed. And so she's blowing the whistle on it. Guys, if you joined us late, I'm reading from a June 2021 uh, paper. It's basically an article written in the journal Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. 
Catherine Flagel is the author. She's talking about her experience of what happened to her with a study that she published. Uh, the title is The Obesity Wars and the Education of a Researcher, a Personal Account. So let's get into this. Thank you so, and Arrow uh, just bought a badge as well. And guys, a reminder, if you're on Instagram, you like what you hear from an influencer, you can support that influencer by go ahead and purchasing a badge right down there, and it definitely helps out. You guys have been awesome today. That's the most badges I've ever gotten doing a live, and I've only been on for five minutes, so thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Clubhouse, for being here today as well. So let's get into this. So again, this is Catherine Flagel talking in the first person. I was a senior scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, for almost 30 years. Beginning in the year 2000, I began working with a CDC colleague, as well as two expert statisticians from the National Cancer Institute on a method by which to estimate the number of deaths associated with people who are overweight or obese. We thought that, that this topic was interesting, and it is, that's a very interesting topic. And all the previous literature that's out there was totally inadequate. As federal employees, we had no outside funding and we had no conflicts of interest in our research. Our intent was to use more recent data and better statistical methods in order to provide more accurate estimates than the hitherto available. But unbeknownst to us, a somewhat similar project was underway elsewhere within the CDC. That project resulted in the 2004 publication in the journal article, uh, the uh, JAMA, so that's the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, it was an article by Mock Dad and other CDC authors. So one of her colleagues at the CDC was also working on similar research at the time. Uh, and it included the then CDC director. Their article concluded that obesity was poised to overtake smoking as the leading cause of death in the U.S. So if you were around uh, circa 15 years ago when that came out, you might remember that. They were saying, oh, obesity is becoming a much greater uh, problem with society than smoking, and it's going to be a bigger cause of death than smoking. Thank you, Kelly. Just bought a badge. Appreciate that. Uh, and so it became a big deal when that study came out. These findings were widely publicized, although, although they were met with some controversy, including people who were anti-tobacco activists. They said, hey, look, cancer and and smoking and all these other reasons are, are, are still just valid, just as valid. Uh, all right, so that article had a lot of flaws though, according to Catherine Flagel, including older, largely unrepresented data sets, erroneous coding of smoking data in one of the data sets, a statistical method that failed to adjust, cor adjust correctly for the confounding variables, and then easily identifiable customized calculation errors that required a correction to be published. So another researcher trying to do similar kind of st statistical types of analysis on the obesity uh, uh, and as it relates to deaths from obesity, they weren't finding that there was uh, more. They, they had to fudge the data, so to speak, on the smoking statistics in order to make the obesity look worse. But Catherine Flagel said for their project, the way they did it, we developed a method that provided appropriate statistical adjustment for all of the confounding variables. In addition, we used recent and nationally representative data sets from the CDC directly. Our results were then published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2005. That is the most prestigious journal in all of medicine, JAMA. A comparison of some features of our article with the 2004 article uh, is shown in table one. So they show kind of a side by side on table one. Um, we found that obesity was indeed associated with death relative to normal weight people, although our estimate of less than 5% of deaths, a direct result of obesity was considerably lower than the 2004 mock dad study, which estimated over 15%. So more than three times the number that Catherine Flagel found in her study was in the other study. 
The CDC accepted our results for obesity as the better estimate uh, a month after our article was published. So they had applied the 15 plus percent the year before with the 2004 one, but then Catherine Flagel's uh, study gets published in JAMA and they go back down to below 5%. Keep in mind, this is legit. This was all, it went through all the process. Watch what happens next because this is so applicable. All of you that scream, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. Watch what happened to Catherine Flagel. This is, I'm just utterly amazed. We found that overweight was associated with slightly but significantly fewer deaths than normal weight people. A quick glance at the literature suggested that our findings about overweight were not particularly unusual. In other words, it was kind of common sense at the time. We were unprepared for the firestorm that was about to hit. Our article attracted attention because it appeared to be inconsistent with the 15 plus percent dramatic conclusions of the 2004 study. I fielded dozens of press calls as soon as our article got published. To my surprise, after the first few hours, many of the journalists who called me had already spoken to a prestigious professor, Walter Willett, from a prestigious school of public health. He's at Harvard, by the way. He was not a statistician. He had no experience in estimating the number of deaths associated with obesity. Our article was not intended to have anything to do with his work at all. Our article uh, got his attention though. He had apparently begun preemptively contacting the press as soon as he found out about this. So this is telling you there are people at play that when they see something that goes against the narrative that they're trying to drive, and again, we're talking about nutritional health, but it applies to any part of science. There are people who have powerful influence, and Walter Willett is still one of those people to this day who has that kind of influence. He inserted himself into the discussion, positioning himself as an expert in the field of the discussion, and providing negative and antagonistic comments on the article before reporters had a chance to talk to the researcher directly. Did you hear all that? So here is Walter Willett basically saying, I know better than this researcher, therefore listen to me, and he got in the ear of the press. Sound familiar? What's happened the last year and a half? Have we had people that talk about things that have happened, that they have no evidence or background or anything, and Bill Gates, um, that you know they can just say things on the air? Yes, yes we have. Like I said, it's apl uh, applicable across lots of scientific disciplines. All right, so Walter Willett used strong language to disparage the article, describing it as, quote, really naive, deeply flawed, and seriously misleading. At a scientific conference a little over a week after our article appeared, uh, one of Walter Willett's co-authors uh, uh, co and cohorts at uh, Harvard, Frank Hugh is his name, another prestigious name in the world of research, um, took the unusual step of preempting a planned presentation by someone else to take the stage. In other words, he took the, the stage over someone else who had the stage so he could make this critique of this article by Catherine Flagel. Are you seeing how they're ganging up on her, you guys? And this happens more often in science than anybody wants to admit. And if we're not going to acknowledge that there are powerful influencers in the science, you can't really follow the science if there's people influencing real science happening. And that's all Catherine Flagel did was she published data that was science, but it ran against the narrative that they were trying to promote about obesity. When I presented a seminar at UC Berkeley a week after our article appeared, an unidentified young woman stood at the door giving out a handout of four pages of faxed and photocopied material that included an abstract from Frank Hugh and Walter Willett, and several news articles that discussed their research on obesity. 
isn't this amazing? Like to, when I read this from Catherine, I was like, oh my God, she is one person out of many that probably have to deal with this. Our 2005 article has been reviewed extensively by scientists within both the CDC and the NCI. It was cleared for publication by both of those agencies. It was reviewed by peer reviewers at the journal, and it was accepted by the number one top medical research uh, institute out there that does journals, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and all the editors, they all let it go through. So what was the problem? Nonetheless, less than a month after it was pu uh, published, a speaker from the American Cancer Society suggested in a talk that our article should not have been published with one of his PowerPoint slides saying, quote, because of the importance of these estimates, scientific controversies should be addressed in a scientific forum that seeks consensus rather than immediately publicizing widely divergent estimates through the media. Can I tell you that is not science. Science is not about consensus. Science is not about being absolute about anything. Science is show me the data, show me the data, show me the data. And if there's conflicting data, then those two data points need to be analyzed and see who's right. Or maybe they're both wrong. Or maybe there's elements of both of them that are right. But you don't dismiss just because you, you would rather have a consensus and you don't like that something went off the narrative that you're putting out there. I get it, they got pissed off because they were trying to make it look like obesity is this humongous killer in America. More than 15% of all deaths in America are attributed to obesity. And then Catherine comes along and says, no, it's less than 5%. It's still bad, but it's not the grand, huge number that it was made out to be in the study the year before, which used flawed data. They were mad that they were upended by a real scientist. That's all this comes down to, guys. Perhaps feeling that lower estimates of obesity-related deaths were detrimental to the overall public health goals, some began casting, uh, casting around for explanations that would show that our estimates were less valid than the 2004 ones. There were fact sheets and lists of talking points. One of, one of them was called Damage Control for the Flagel Article. All of these began to circulate from various public health oriented groups, describing our estimates as problematic and giving misleading arguments as to why the 2004 estimates were better. The damage control talking points, for example, asserted that the 2004 paper was far superior because it had used data on, quote, diet and physical activity, end quote, even though the 2004 paper had not used any data on diet or physical activity. Another group that included both Walter Willett and Frank Hugh published a long speculative article in 2007 about reconciling the differences that failed to mention the errors in their paper that she mentioned earlier. Ended up announcing that the real problem was that we had asked the wrong question, even though they answered the exact same question in the 2005 paper uh, Catherine Flagel's paper as the one in 2004. When you convolute the waters because you don't have an answer, you confuse people, it's all by design. Does this sound familiar again? Think about the last year and a half. Things that were banned a year ago, censored a year ago, silenced a year ago, now suddenly being true. And back then we were told, trust the science. And if you don't trust the science, you're a conspiracy theorist nut. And now all those things that were conspiracy theories are actually valid today. You see the similarities? Almost as soon as our article appeared, a symposium was scheduled for the express purpose of criticizing our article. This is when you know you're doing something right. Catherine Flagel may not see it this way, but hopefully she'll hear this perspective I'm gonna send her this video so she can see this, but when there is this much animosity and vitriol and rushing to correct you, you hit a nerve. You touched on something that they were hoping wouldn't get out. You know too much, Catherine. You know something that they know inherently 
is true because what you did was real science. And the real science, the real stats that you found were legitimately what the real deal is. They didn't like that because the agenda was, let's make obesity look like it's a killer. Because then I know these researchers are like, okay, well, if we can make it look like 15 plus percent of all deaths come from obesity, then we're gonna get more money for obesity research. That's what Walter Willett and Frank Hugh were looking for. But then she blows the lid off of that with her much lower statistic. Again, 5% is still too much, but it's not this grand one that it was made out to be. One of the organizers of that event uh, that was going to criticize the article wrote to me to say that they viewed this as an opportunity to engage in a respectful and constructive examination of all the issues and provide a much more in-depth view for the media so they could more deeply understand what the paper was about. The lineup consisted of a small number of vocal critics, mostly uh, Walter Willett and Frank Hugh were the primary ones, all attacking our work and asserting that their previous research somehow showed that our estimate should have been higher, although their previous research not e did not even address the topic of estimating the number of deaths. The presentations at the symposium did not mention the multiple errors that were found in the 2004 paper. One of the speakers described us as having no biomedical background, even though the four authors on the article were all well-published senior scientists, all of them had doctorate degrees in nutrition or statistics, and one had a medical de degree from Harvard. Seeking to maximize the media coverage, the organizers arranged for the entire symposium to be live over the internet and encouraged reporters to watch it and then report on it. There were further attacks, many not all from the same group and its alumni, continuing over many years. These ranged over a broad gamut, criticisms that we repeatedly uh, refuted, generic minor criticisms that would apply to most articles in the general field, misinformation, content insults, or uh, content free insults, name calling, sometimes outright falsehoods. Like you think it's just social media where all that stuff happens? This is science, guys. We think science is prestigious, and it is. But even behind the scenes of science, guys, they still play a lot of the same games you see play out on social media. It took me far too long to understand that our findings were being treated by some as a partisan issue rather than a topic of scientific discussion. And this is a key about this. This was a lady that did a really good study and found results that went far different from what was the established science of the time. They wanted that 15 plus percent deaths from obesity to be this grand gesture that said, see, this is why we need more money for obesity research. And then along comes Catherine Flagel with her study in 2005 that says, yeah, guys, it's, it's actually less than a third of that. It's still bad, we still need to look at it, but here's the actual statistics. And I think they got mad that a real scientist came in behind them and corrected the error. And now they tried to disparage her as a result. It's disgusting. Our work was attacked in a surprising variety of non-scientific forums, blog posts on the internet, social media, in-house newsletters, widely distributed fact sheets, and Wikipedia entries. We repeatedly, repeatedly demonstrated that the criticisms that would, were being raised would have little or no effect on our results, but these demonstrations were ignored or dismissed. In other words, they were trying to bully her into changing her statistics. Guys, is that science? Don't we as a general public want science to just stand on its own merit? We don't want science to conform to a narrative. We want science to be, gee, I don't know, science, right? And sometimes there's gonna be disagreement within the science. So that's when you you look at what, uh, what she did, what Flagel did in her study. She said, look, I recognize the errors in the way they came up with the data for the 2004 study. We corrected those errors and made better research for the 2005 paper that she had published in JAMA. They didn't like that they got undercut. All, of, all it is is a hissy fit. 
A number of the researchers prepared papers to attack our work, employing convoluted analyses of unclear validity. I began to call these Flagel is wrong papers because their primary intent appeared appeared to prove that something was wrong with our paper that had caused our estimates to be too low. Such papers often contained a speculative rescue hypothesis claiming with no evidence whatsoever that if some particular feature of our research had been different, then the estimates would have been higher. In several of the cases, we went to the effort of writing and publishing a brand new article that would demonstrate that one after another of these speculative hypotheses did not explain the results. For example, Manson et al. had incorrectly speculated that older ages at at measurement had led to a downward bias in the estimates. We published an article that showed that their speculation was wrong. One research group repeatedly tried to publish a paper with the claim that although we had used age at the timeline, if we had also used age in our models, we would have gotten a different result. <clears throat> so to forestall the eventual publication of this erroneous claim, we published a brief article to demonstrate that such inclusion would not have changed the results. Look at all this extra work this researcher who put in great scientific process and everything. Look at the look at what they had to do to try to like damage control all the vicious attacks against their research. And it should beg the question by the way. Why were they so scared of her results? Because look, if it was inconclusive or error ridden and all this, then you would just say that and then stick with your 15% plus number. I think they know they got caught with their pants down that their stats were fudged a little bit and hers were actually based on, on good data. And they got mad that they got caught. Guys, that's not science. We want to pretend like science is this high prestigious thing that in irrefutable and, and it should be it should be heralded but not worshipped. And I think what's happening is that 15% number, they tried to worship it. And so when along comes Flagel's paper that says don't worship it because it's, about, it's less than a third of that, they didn't like that. They got undercut. Although the Flagel is wrong papers referred specifically to our article, they often misunderstood key details. These papers tended to focus on the analytical methods rather than on the data itself. But in fact, our use of more updated and better quality data accounted for much of the difference. We had used nationally represented, uh, re representative survey data with measured weights and heights. Critics rarely have ever noted that our findings might be due to the use of the better data. So they were trying to criticize the process by which they gathered the statistics. And she's saying, no, look at the actual data that we pulled. <clears throat> Some criticisms employed a rhetorical approach uh, known as paltering, defined as the active use of truthful statements with the intent to deceive. Critics would emphasize that our article found different results than previous, previous articles had, and then mention some criticism of our article with the implication that this was the reason for the difference. However, they would not mention that the same criticisms also applied to the 2004 paper, and thus that did not explain the differences. For example, one laboratory exercise for graduate students in epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University compared our results unfavorably to those of the 2004 study. Uh, they stated four different times that our study had only used a single measure of BMI, and then they asked the students to quote, discuss the appropriateness and effect of using a single measure of BMI in attributing subsequent deaths to obesity. But they didn't note that in the 2004 study, guess what they did? They used a single measure of BMI. So if they're gonna scrutinize Flagel's study, they had to also scrutinize the 2004 study. Attacks on our paper continued Guys, this is four years after the study's published now. They're still attacking her and her paper, which again has to beg the question, it, why would they do that? If it was just bogus data, why would they be so, so vigilant about coming after her and her study? It's amazing. 
A 2007 story appeared in Scientific American by a leading health journalist who had never even contacted the CDC press office, nor had they spoken to me. Remember, this is Catherine Flagel speaking. But nonetheless asserted that our conclusions were probably wrong, quote unquote, and they talked to two Harvard faculty at length. It's complete nonsense, said one of them. It's obviously complete nonsense, very easy to explain why some people have gone astray, said another. In the same year, a postdoc at Harvard posted the following on a blog. Numbers from Flagel's paper have been sub sub uh, subsequently retracted by the CDC, and she has subsequently been demoted at the CDC for writing such an erroneous paper. That's what was claimed. Every single one of these statements were false though. The CDC had not retracted the findings. I had not been demoted, she said. In fact, our paper got the CDC's highest science award, the Shepherd Award in 2006. After I called the postdoc to point out his errors, he apologized and deleted his post. He was unable or unwilling to tell me where he had gotten all the misinformation from, although he assured me it was not from Harvard. These are the games she had to play, you guys. A 2007 article from a different Harvard group claimed falsely that the CDC had recanted the 2005 article. I was impressed that this unreferenced statement could have been written to begin with and then could get through reviewers, editors, copy editors without anyone asking for a clarification or showing any proof of evidence. At our request and after some negotiation, the authors reluctantly published an error uh, uh, that they made an error. Around the same time, there were some unusual statements anonymously inserted in the Wikipedia entry on, quote, overweight. These statements asserted with no references <coughs> that our article had been widely discredited and regarded as totally, uh, fatally flawed by researchers from the Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard Medical School, American Cancer Society, and even the CDC itself which had backtracked on the findings from the Flago report. That was what was put under overweight on Wikipedia. This was part of what appeared to be an ongoing campaign to present our article in an unfavorable light incorrectly as being repudiated by various reputable sources. In 2007, I accepted an invitation to give a lecture at the 2008 meeting of a scientific society. The invitation included no mention of any kind of rebuttal. When I got the final program a month before the meeting, to my surprise, Frank Hugh from Harvard had been added as a rebuttal speaker. This is an unusual way to treat an invited lecturer. As part of Frank Hugh's rebuttal, he presented a slide supposedly based on our research that strangely showed precisely the opposite of what we had found. It turned out that Frank Hugh and his group had misunderstood a table in our published article and then misinterpreted the results as, as a result. Although I wrote him an email to clarify the table, Frank Hugh and his colleagues at Harvard nonetheless submitted it, an article for publication that had that same erroneous analysis. Fortunately, though, their article was rejected. This led me to realize that if such an article were to get published with erroneous analysis, it would likely be quite difficult for me to ever correct it again. And think about it. There's precedence when it comes to research, you guys. Once a study gets published, it then begets other studies that then reference that study. And this is why I always call out bad research. Because if there's a bad study that gets published, gets past peer review, gets through the editors and all the process, and then it gets published, it becomes like the law in science that then gets, see, according to the study in by, by Flagel et al., this, this is discredited, blah, 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 blah. This happens a lot. And so thank, thank goodness that that did not get uh, published. Uh, this episode, as well as others, led me to realize that some, perhaps uh, many of our critics, have very little understanding of what our original article was about. Frank Hugh gave a completely in, incorrect description of our method on page 46 of his book that was published in 2008. Another line of attack was something like, well, this is, quote, just one study. According to the 2007 hit piece in Scientific American, 
decades of research and thousands of studies have suggested precisely the opposite, adding that Flagel is not necessarily wrong, but the preponderance of the evidence clearly points in another direction. In fact, many other studies had already shown no excess mortality associated with overweight. The 2013 obesity guidelines that were put out by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society also reported the finding that overweight did not appear to be associated with extra death, rating that the strength of the evidence as moderate. Frank Hugh was a co-author on those guidelines. A study using nationally representative Canadian data appeared in 2010 with similar findings to the one Flagel found. Subsequently, the CDC and the NIH co-authors, uh, the Canadian researcher and I carried out a systematic literature review. It was published in JAMA in 2013. <clears throat> Before publication, our article had been ex uh, extensively reviewed by scientists at the CDC and the NCI for clearance for publication by both agencies. The summary results from 97 published studies had a total of 3 million patients that were overweight and it was associated with slightly but significantly lower mortality than normal weight reference category. An anonymous peer reviewer commented, quote, this study documents the conclusion that I suspect most people who follow the health and obesity literature have concluded but not formalized in spite of the labeling of BMI of 25 to less than 30 with the pejorative title of overweight. The data on mortality do not support that this category of BMI has any kind of increased mortality. In other words, Flagel, you were right. Do you see what the what they what she went through? Like she, she was put through the ringer about this. All at the holy altar of your science is not good enough because it does not fit our paradigm. And again, I ask, with all the events of the last year and a half, all the trust the science on masks, the hokey pokey, HCQ, all these things, it makes you wonder, right? As was clear from our review and from many articles published since, our findings were not unusual. Walter Willett was evidently aware of this since he was quoted as saying, quote, about every 10 years, this idea comes along that says it's better to be overweight and we have to stomp that out, end quote. When I reviewed the literature for our 2013 meta-analysis, <clears throat> I noticed that almost all the articles, although almost all the, all the articles, including some from our critics, had found that either no increased mortality from the overweight or else slightly decreased mortality, few of them ever mentioned this in the abstract nor did they give it any kind of prominence in the press coverage. No wonder, no wonder people thought our findings for the overweight category were unusual. It was not evident that it was common, even though they were acknowledging it's common. Apparently, according to some of our critics, new and better scientific results are dangerous and they cause confusion if they fail to buttress what you already believe. Does that sound familiar? We can't look at more recent research because that's dangerous. We need to rely on what we've always known. But what if new science shows that what you've always known back there, what if new research shows there's a different paradigm you should be believing? That's science, guys. And I'm so tired of us having to bow down to the holy altar of science, but it's the old science. It's kind of like what happened to keto. This, this happened back in 2015. Paleo was still pretty big and I was in the paleo community at the time and they allowed a speaker from the main stage at Paleo FX to basically do a hit piece uh, lecture on how keto is dangerous. And you know what you know what the lecturer did? She went back into the 1920s and looked at all the uh, keto research of epileptic children. So she had to go back a hundred years. She had to look at very sick children who were on a very prescriptive type of keto diet. Nothing like the keto diet we eat now, but because that was the data she was using and that was the established keto data, 
None of the work of Westman and Finney and Volick and all the other modern research of ketogenic diets, it was all predicated on that older science. And that's what she's talking about here that, well, we have a, a great deal of, of older science that needs to be you know, respected and da, 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 da. And no, there's newer science that trunks that. All right. All right, so with our 2013 uh, rev review appeared, Walter Willett fired off an email to my employer uh, at the CDC reply reprising all the same themes of the 2005 paper that is damage and confusion, saying that he thought a meeting was important to repair the serious damage <coughs> done by a review article, which according to Walter Willett, had not only caused public confusion over this issue, but had also contributed to undermining confidence in science. No, sir, you're the reason that there is any kind of undermining of confidence in the science. And he's not the only one. Walter Willett, by the way, guys, he is just a microcosm of what happens across all the disciplines of science. Dr. Fauci is another kind of Walter Willett. He's the one kind of putting things out there. And of course, he kind of goes back and forth on things. And so it confuses people. That undermines the science. And Snoochie is right. People are living the new science and proving the new science. So that needs to be honored. A second tribunal was convened at Harvard, this time to attack the 2013 literature review. The speaker lineup was almost identical to the same symposium that opposed her paper in 2005. <clears throat> According to a news report, the panelists expressed concern that much of the popular journalism and commentary about Flagel's research could undermine the credibility of science itself. The symposium didn't even pretend to be objective or even handed. Its purpose, as was clearly laid out in the in-house newsletter, was to quote, elucidate the inaccuracies in a recent high-profile JAMA article which claimed that being overweight leads to reduced mortality. But what if the science showed that? If we want to follow the science, you can't only follow the science when the science fits your agenda. If you're going to follow the science, you have to, gee, I don't know, follow the science wherever it goes. This kind of thing happens a lot, you guys. And I'm so grateful for Catherine Flagel for sharing very detailed notes about her experience with this. Because if this is happening to one obesity researcher that goes off the beaten path of the narrative, how many others are just being silenced and we don't know about? And there's data out there that's never even seen the light of day. Thankfully, she's a prestigious enough researcher and got into major studies. So that's, that's good. Um, but it's happening more often than, than we want to admit. According to the in-house Harvard coverage, each panelist presented a clear, compelling case as to why the general public should not rely on these flawed study findings, giving attendees numerous reasons to question the validity of the study. So here's the other thing. They're calling it flawed. Why don't you let the data speak for itself rather than using a pejorative and describing it as flawed? Why not let people see the study? Why not let people see the merits of the study compared to other studies? That's science, but that's not what they allow. They had to disparage it. In an interview with the BBC, Walter Willett announced regarding our 2013 review and meta-analysis, this is an incredibly big pile of rubbish and it was even worse rubbish than the 2005 study in a radio interview on npr walter willett again called the 2013 article rubbish and said that no one should even read the paper now is that scientific don't even read the paper no let's read the paper and then tell me what flaws are in said paper that are valid don't tell me don't read the paper. That sounds to me like you don't want people to read the paper because you know it's got stuff in there that's true. Hearing him say this out loud made a bad impression on me. 
and many of the listeners as well who all wrote to me about it. One woman wrote that Walter Willett sounded like a bully. He was a bully. His behavior was criticized by the editors of the scientific journal Nature. Although much of the furor after that has died down, the attacks have continued on. For example, in a commentary in 2014 about dietary intakes and a review article in 2015 about dietary intakes, both Walter Willett and Frank Q in, uh, included gratuitous comments about how misleading and contrary meta-analysis findings were, and they cited our meta-analysis as an example of confusing and dangerous conclusions. Neither of these articles about dietary intake had anything to do with our meta-analysis or with obesity or with mortality. Frank Q organized a group to publish his own Flagel is Wrong paper in The Lancet back in 2016, itself with a questionable method and uh, demonstrable flaws. The initial intent of these attacks seemed to be to discredit our work completely. They employed uh, denigrating and insulting remarks, things like rubbish, ludicrous, complete nonsense, fatally flawed, widely discredited, implying that our work was not worthy of even seriously being considered. There were also suggestions that we were unqualified and my integrity and competence were questioned. Some attacks were surprisingly petty. At one point, Walter Willett posted in a discussion group regarding salt intake that JAMA had shown a track record of poor editorial judgment. Keep in mind, JAMA is the leading medical research journal in the world. Everybody wants to get published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So that's shocking to hear Willett describe them that way. Uh, similarly, again, using a diminutive form of my name, Professor One, who is uh, Walter Willett, told one reporter, Kathy Flagel, instead of Catherine, he said Kathy, uh, just doesn't get it. It became clear that one of the things that critics found disturbing was that they called the lay media or the popular press, uh, which apparently extended to the New York Times, the Scientific American, even Nature, a leading scientific journal, all had reported on our findings as though they were worthy of serious discussion. One of the effects of the public insults may also have been to deter or intimidate other investigators. And this is the problem. When science, true science, like Catherine Flagel's uh, paper, is challenged to this degree and maligned to this degree, other researchers are watching and going, oh crap, if we publish studies that have similar kinds of results that go against the narrative, they're gonna come after us. Guys, quite frankly, this is cancel culture for science. They tried to cancel Flagel over this because she was willing to speak the truth. It's gross. An anonymous researcher was quoted elsewhere as saying, uh, if character assassi assassination is the price for publishing data that contradicts established belief, fewer academics will ever stick their necks out and offer up any kind of fresh thinking. Can I tell you, if you don't challenge current paradigms, you will never grow. You will never be able to extend the science. All you do is extend the narrative. And extending the narrative may miss the science that's actually there, and then there's casualties from that. Maybe literal ones in this case. Our findings were simply findings. We didn't have an argument, an explanation, a recommendation, or statement of any kind of opinion. However, some apparently had trouble grasping this, referring to our findings as claims, as though this was a matter of uh, questionable assertions, not of the data. For example, a 2017 Facebook polo, uh, post from a senior NCI scientist, as well as a Harvard graduate, referred to our, quote, dangerous and persistent claims. Even though their work had little relevance to our estimates, this Harvard group created a false narrative in which they and I were adversaries taking sides and duking it out rhetorically. This myth even made its way into a lecture at the NIH by an eminent researcher who stated incorrectly that some Harvard faculty and I were feuding <coughs> and they refused to appear on the same platform together. When I pointed out this was not true, he graciously apologized and said it was something he had just heard. 
Both our 2005 article and the 2013 article were straightforward, transparent. Both are still cited frequently throughout the medical literature. We presented our findings objectively and even-handedly without cloaking them in any kind of spin that was designed to obscure possible inconvenient results. Uh, that's called white hat bias, by the way, in the research lingo. Indeed, this lack of spin may have been one of the reasons why our findings were con, uh, considered to be surprising. Our article drew only uh, data that were free, readily publicly available, and could be easily checked by anyone else. The controversy was some, something deliberately manufactured. The attacks were primarily consisted of repeated assertions of all these preconceived opinions. Nonetheless, these attacks were surprisingly effective. A small number of vocal critics succeeded in raising considerable doubt, a considerable doubt about our work while concealing major errors in the estimates that they preferred. One result was that unlike other researchers who had published articles on the same topic, we ourselves were sometimes treated as though we were advocates, not scientists striving to be objective. At first, I was startled by all this, but eventually I came to expect partisan attacks masquerading as scientific concerns. I had expected some modest interest in the findings pursued through all the normal channels of scientific discussion, but what I had not expected was an aggressive campaign that included insults, errors, misinformation, gossip, maneuvers, social media posts, and even complaints to the CDC, her employer, many more instances than I have to describe in this space. It seemed that some felt our work should be judged not on its merit, but rather on whether its findings supported the goals and objectives of those who are in the establishment. This is a problem. I saw firsthand the antagonism that can be provoked by inconvenient scientific findings. Guys, we need people that are willing to buck the trend because if the data that you find in a study <clears throat> and your study methodology is all great, if they find data that runs counter to what is the established known, don't we want that? Isn't that what you look for in science is, okay, we think we know something, let's challenge it, let's run data points, let's do better methodology, use better data, which is what she did. Don't you want better science? Don't you want science to progress? Science cannot progress unless current science is challenged. And that's all she was trying to do here. Guidelines and recommendations should be based on objective and unbiased data. Development of public health policy and clinical recommendations is complex and needs to be evidence-based rather than belief-based. This can be challenging when a hot button topic is involved. Scientific uh, findings should be evaluated on their merits not on the basis of whether they fit a desired narrative. So guys, again, go check out this paper. You can go read it online. It's published in the June 2021 journal, Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. The paper article, the article here, uh, Catherine M. Flagel. She's from the Stanford Prevention Research Center, uh, Center at the School of Medicine at Stanford. And the name of her paper, The Obesity Wars and the Education of a Researcher, a Personal Account. Go check it out, guys. But I love that she's exposing this because we're hearing a lot out there right now about trust the science. The science is right. We need to follow the science. All of that is cool. But when you're silencing and disparaging and smearing someone who has science that runs counter to what you're saying, that's not okay. We need to be allowing dissenting voices to share other research. Like if they had said, okay, let's bring Catherine Flagel and the 2004 researchers together on the same stage and let's compare and contrast the data in a, in a joint talk, that would have been cool. But they didn't give her that opportunity. They decided to malign her, disparage her, and try to make her look like the fool. Kudos to her, by the way, for standing her ground. And after the 2005 incident, I'm surprised she decided to delve back into it again in 2013 with the new paper because she knew what was coming. 
and here is the last two decades of her career, has been basically mopping up all the nonsense of how her papers were disparaged. And to this day, her paper is still very widely noted in other research papers, and it's, and it's honored, but it has a little bit of a black eye because they didn't like that she was showing data different than theirs. So let this be a lesson. When somebody says, follow the science, that we need to trust the science, you kind of have to ask the question, what science? Which one? The one that they want us to hear or all the science? And it should be always all the science. So guys, thank you so much for being here today. Hope you enjoyed this uh, special Instagram Live.